We have been talking about the church. Remember we defined recently the church's identity. Who is the church? And the church bears four markers. A Christian is not someone who says they are a Christian. A Christian is someone who God says is a Christian. And God says that his people have four distinct, they all share these four things. What's the first one, everybody? Repent. Repentance. Mm-hmm. Repentance is a change of heart that encompasses your desires, your thoughts, and your will. What you desire, the way you think, and what you want is changed. This is a clear marker of of who belongs to God. Number two, faith. Faith is a confidence, a confidence in who Jesus is and what he has said. It's being persuaded. What's the third one? And this is what we're going to talk about tonight. What's the third? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. We're going to learn a lot about the Holy Spirit. And then lastly... Yes, and then what is the last one? Baptism. Baptism. You saw that when those who believed they were baptized. And by the way, just so we all understand, the word baptize is a Greek word that means to immerse. So what the, the, the actual practical form of baptism in the New Testament was exhibited by John the Baptist standing in the water. And the people would come down the water and he would immerse them in the water and lift them out. And we're going to be talking about baptism later on. That'll be the next one after the Holy Spirit. But these are the four markers of the church. The church's identity is that. The church's purpose is given to us in 1 Peter 2, verse 9. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. By the way, I ask us all on Sunday. This is something we really need to think about Am I consciously thinking about what a special person I am in the world? You are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. Look at the language God uses to describe you. You are a people for his own possession that you should proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The church's purpose is to declare how great God is. That is the ultimate purpose of your life. Is that people would look at your life and say, God is a great and living Savior because I see him in you. I hear him in you. That's the ultimate purpose of your life. That's why you've been made a people for God's own possession. Then we saw on Sunday the church's mission. Remember, the purpose is why the church is here, and the mission is what is it here to do. Remember I gave you guys an illustration on Sunday of that of Walt Disney when they first started their company. The guy started Disney University, and he said that the purpose for Disneyland is to make people happy. And you, you work third shift, you work in the vending, you clean the streets. But the reason you're doing all that is to make people happy. For a Christian, whatever the mission is, the reason we're doing it is to declare how great God is. So I need to think about that the way I live my life. If what I'm doing right now does not declare to people that God is great, then I not, do, shouldn't do it anymore. That's not a part of my purpose. So I got to really think about that. I think even families, you guys ought to come up. I encourage you families, you ought to come up with a purpose statement for your family. Every believer ought to have a purpose statement for their life. The ultimate purpose of your life is to declare how great God is. So that helps me to look at, to step back and look at my life and say, okay, if what I'm doing is not fulfilling that purpose, then I can cut that out. The mission, the purpose is why the church is here. 
The mission is what is it here to do? And as we saw on Sunday, the church's mission, the church is here to proclaim the gospel, defend the gospel, and live the gospel so that everyone who believes will become fully grown in Christ. The church is, is explaining what Christ, who he is, what he has done, how that impacts all their life. We're defending against false gospels. And we're putting the gospel to practice in our life so that everyone who places their confidence in Jesus will become fully grown. They won't stay immature. They won't be blown around by every wind of doctrine. Uh, they, they'll learn to lay aside the weights and the sins that used to entangle them. They'll start running stronger. The normal Christian life, believe it or not, the longer it goes, the better it gets, the healthier it gets, the younger it gets. That's the normal Christian development. So that, that means that Down City Church, for anyone that's going to be a part of Down City, we have a goal for you. It's God's goal for you. That is that you will become fully grown in Christ. You will grow to maturity. Now, I want to introduce tonight the third of the four markers that identify the church. And we'll just begin this tonight. And I want to just notice, so that the third marker that identifies the church is the Holy Spirit. Now, by way of introduction tonight, I just want to establish a few things right off the bat, and we'll talk about all the ways he aids us next week. But for now, I want to just first understand that the Holy Spirit is God. I want to demonstrate this in the Bible. I want you guys to follow this along with me. Notice with me in Acts chapter 5 and verse 1. So when we talk about the Holy Spirit, who are we talking about? Uh, Acts chapter 5 and verse 1. And I just want to give you several references that establish the divinity of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is God. Notice Acts chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. The scripture says, But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. So what was going on at this time in the early church, the Bible says these guys have, were such together as a community there were rich members of the Christian church. There were poor members and some of the wealthy members, in order that their poor members would have food and be able to take care of the family, some of the rich members were selling some of their property and giving the proceeds to the poor ones. So apparently you have a wealthy family, Ananias and Sapphira, this couple, who goes and sells pro, uh, uh, some land, property, but when they came and brought the proceeds to the disciples, they kept back part of it. They were pretending they were giving all of it. That's what Cain did, right? Well, no, Cain's something different. Because he didn't give all, he didn't bring all the foods to the Lord. What Cain did and is Abel he brought did. a wrong offering. Right, it was like a... These guys are bringing a deceptive one. Okay. So watch what happens. The Bible says, Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. And he just said in verse 3, he lied to the Holy Spirit. Now he says you lied to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came upon all who heard of it. Let's look at another reference, the very next book of the Bible, Romans chapter 8, verses 9 through 11. Romans chapter 8, verses 9 through 11. And the scripture says here, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. 
Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Now, isn't that interesting? He calls him both the spirit of God, and then he calls him the spirit of Christ. So he is equating the spirit with the other two members of the Trinity. And by the way, this is not any spirit. It is the spirit of God, he says. Now go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 to 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 to 12. The very next book to the right, 1 Corinthians 2, 10 to 12. It says here, These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. So by the way, that just tells me that if you're going to really understand the gospel, the Spirit's going to have to help you understand it. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person, which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. In other words, who is the only one that can understand the person's thought? That person. Who is the only one that can stand God thought, understand God's thoughts? That person is Spirit. Now we have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. Notice chapter 3, verse 16 of the same book, just right across the page. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? There again, equate, equates God's spirit with God. Notice chapter 12, verses 4 to 6 of the same chapter. Chapter 12, verses 4 to 6. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. Notice he refers to all three members of the Trinity. Verse 4, the Spirit. Verse 5, the Son. Verse 6, the Father. And he says, he is the one empowering you. We also, if we want to study chapter 12, we know it is the Spirit that's empowering you. Give you one more reference just to establish that the Holy Spirit is God. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. Hebrews 9, verse 14. Notice what it says here. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through, and he gives a description of the spirit that only belongs to God. There is only one of this type of being in the universe. What does he call the spirit here? In verse 14. What's the adjective he gives for the spirit? How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the what kind of spirit? Eternal. That's an attribute of God. So these references all establish for us that the Holy Spirit is God. So when we say what we're about to learn about the Holy Spirit, understand that the one who is dealing with us is God himself when we talk about the Holy Spirit. Now, I just want to point out two more things tonight, and then we're going to go into this in much more detail next week. The second thing I want to point out by way of introduction tonight is not only is the Holy Spirit God, but the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit is received upon repentance and faith in Christ. Now watch this. Go back with me to the history book of the New Testament, Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, and notice verse 38. Acts 2 and verse 38. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Notice chapter 5, verse 32. Notice 5, verse 32. And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to who? To those who obey him. The scripture uses this term when it comes to the gospel, to obey the gospel. 
Upon repentance and faith, a person is given the Holy Spirit. Notice chapter 11, verses 15 to 18. Chapter 11, verses 15 to 18. Peter is now talking about the Italian general who was saved, and he says in 11.15, As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. And I remember the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And by the way, who is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit? Jesus does. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us, when? When did he give them that gift? When we, when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who was I that I could stand in God's way? And when they heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. What was the evidence then that God had given them repentance? The Holy Spirit. Can you receive the Holy Spirit without being baptized? You receive the Holy Spirit upon repentance and faith. Okay, because those people who are not baptized. That's right. Still can receive the Holy Spirit. That's right. Through okay. because the, as the Bible says, Jesus baptizes you with the Spirit. With the Spirit, mm -hmm. correct. Okay. So wait, you don't have to be baptized physically. No, the Holy Spirit is given by Jesus the moment you repent and believe. Now, water baptism in the New Testament was the outward way to express my faith in Christ. Water baptism, just like when we take the Lord's Supper on Sunday, we take the bread and the juice. Amen. Jesus already died. He's not dying again. What am I doing when I take the bread and the juice? I am, I am illustrating the gospel. When I get baptized in water, I am illustrating the gospel. I have been baptized with the Holy Spirit. So is baptism a cleanliness? Because when the Lord flooded the earth, he cleaned up everybody who was evil. So when you get baptized, I feel the past is the past. It's all gone now. It's, it's a great question. You know, the Bible says, and we're actually going to look at this reference uh, in fact, I want to take, we'll go there, let's get, we're on our way there, we're on our way there. Come with me first to Acts 15, verses 8 and 9. Acts 15, 8 and 9. Notice what it says here in Acts 15, verses 8 and 9. This is not the reference I'm talking about, I'm going to get there in a few. Acts 15, 8 and 9. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, and how does it say he cleansed their hearts there, Ron? By faith. By faith. That's how he cleans them. Okay, now we're going to keep going in a second, but I just want to notice, when a person comes to repentance and faith, God gives them a new heart, they now have confidence in Jesus. At that moment, they are baptized with the Holy Spirit. He cleanses them by faith. Water baptism is the outward demonstration of the inward reality. Okay, let's go just a few more. Tim, Look, yes. You don't have to be bapt physically immersed in water in right. order to be, like, saved, right? It's not, like, an act. It's not, it, it, the works is not going to get you into heaven, right? Yeah, so, that was... I was Catholic first. Sure. Right. I, I know. I was dipped. <laughs> right. They, you were sprinkled. Yeah. You have to oh, do whatever. You have to do X, Y, and Z. So it's with cat the Catholics it's faith plus works equals salvation. No, it's faith alone. It's, yep, that's good. That's good. good. That's good. Yep. Well, I'm a former Catholic too. Man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, let's look at a few more. Galatians chapter three and verse fourteen. Galatians 3, verse 14. The Bible says in Galatians 3, verse 14, In Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised Spirit. How? Through faith. 
Two more, Ephesians 1 in verse 13. Ephesians 1 verse 13 says, the very next book of the Bible, chapter 1 verse 13, in him, that's in Jesus, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. When you heard the gospel, when you believed, at that moment, you were sealed. And, and again, the word seal is like a stamp. God puts his, that's, that's authentically mine. Bingo, that's, what, that's mine. All right, and look at one more. Titus chapter 3, verses 4 and 6. This is the one I was going to tell you about earlier, Ron. Just keep going to the right. Titus chapter 3, verses 4 to 6. Titus 3, verses 4 to 6 says, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration, that's new life, and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Jesus gives the Holy Spirit. And what does the Spirit do? He internally baptizes you. He internally cleanses you. That's what happens. Now, next Wednesday, I want to really discover what does the, ministry, the Spirit do? Who is God? I just want to say this by way of introduction tonight. The key title that the Holy Spirit is given in the New Testament is the title helper. This is amazing. Do you know the Greek word helper is a word that means to come alongside? Like an assistant, like a counselor, like a comforter like an advocate, like an intercessor. The Bible describes the one noun given to God's, given to the Holy Spirit, is he is a helper. What he does is he helps everyone who has come to faith in Jesus in many, many, many ways. And that's what we're going to discover together next, next week. And this helper, we're going to begin to learn, the scripture says, actually comes to live within believers. Could that be your, your conscience? No. Nope. Because it's telling you, don't do it, don't do it, don't we do it. We all have the conscience. You know, the Bible house. says non-Christians have a conscience. In fact, the Bible says one day, there are going to be people who are going to be judged by God on the basis of their conscience, the fact that they ignored their conscience. Mm -hmm. So there, are the, even non-believers have a conscience that accuses them or else excuses them. So their conscience, even for a person to say, well, I didn't really understand a lot, God says you're going to, you had a conscience. So the conscience is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is actually a person. And that's what we're going to learn we're going to dive into next week, okay? All right. Why don't we close with prayer tonight? Lord, thank you for our wonderful time together tonight, and we thank you for, the Lord, the amazing ministry of your Spirit in the lives of your children, and I pray that you will just help us to really grow in our understanding and our recognition of you in our lives. Thank you for just all that you're doing in our church, Lord, for everyone that's gathered tonight. We look forward to what you have for us in the days ahead. May we grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And may the love of Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and the grace of God be with us all. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.